What does that do? Makes me indestructible. You can't intimidate a person who is objective. Intimidation affects only your subjective experience. I don't want to die. Okay, then I got you over a barrel. I'm using your subjective feelings and experiences against you. Every, every function in the human being has its own agenda. The mind does what a mind does because that's what gives it pleasure. The heart, the emotions, do what they do because that's what gives the heart pleasure. So there are different pleasures, and those pleasures stimulate activities. The potential pleasure in understanding and in knowledge makes your mind want to know. And when you want to know, you do what it takes and you get to know. The heart loves emotional excitement, emotional experiences. So it seeks emotional pleasure. Different emotions, different pleasures. Sometimes you're in the mood for something sweet, sometimes you're in the mood for something sour or intense. The eye wants to see because there's a pleasure in seeing. The ear wants to hear because there's a pleasure in hearing. So, of course, it's not the eye itself or the ear itself. It's the function of the soul. The soul can see and hear, and every function of the soul, every symptom of life, is pleasurable. So the question is, if every part of my system has an agenda of its own, can I ever really be objective? Can I really say, I know you, I see you, I get you, I feel what you feel? Or is it always my agenda? I don't really know you, I know what I think of you, but how am I supposed to know you? In other words, no function in the human being seems to be objective. Objective enough to see what's really there. And that's why we can't handle the truth. Not because the truth scares us. We just don't have tools for it. I don't have a tool that is objective enough to be able to see what's out there without my coloring it, spinning it, molding it into something that gives me pleasure. Love is blind, because when I want love, I just want love. I don't care if it makes sense. I don't care if it's true. Love pursues love. Intellect pursues intellect. I want to make sense of everything I see, whether it makes sense or not. So, for example, a miracle happens. I, I don't understand miracles. I need an explanation. How did it happen? What caused it to happen? Then, I'm, then my mind is content. But you tell me it was a miracle? My mind says, does not compute. I don't understand miracle. So a part of you says, well, you don't have to understand everything. There are some things you don't understand. But if I don't understand it and I don't love it, then what's my interest? Then I don't care. Well, there's a part of me that actually loves what doesn't make sense. That's another agenda. I love mystery. I love being in awe, like, wow, I don't understand that at all. Isn't that exciting? It's beyond comprehension. Isn't that exciting? 
Yes, that has its own kind of excitement. So here's the problem. We have, for example, the mitzvah to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. To love him. But I'm never going to get there. I will love what is lovable. I will appreciate what I understand. And I will get a thrill from not understanding. But it's never about him. It's always about me. My thinking, my pleasure, my experience, my love. So how can you say love him? In fact, how can you say love anybody? It's never the other person that is being loved. It's something within my own system enjoying itself. Love being in love. Right now it's you. Tomorrow it'll be somebody else. So Hasidus teaches that there is a part of the soul that is truly objective. It has no agenda. It is not pleasure seeking. And so it can it can be objective. It can perceive or apprehend what is out there without discoloring or spinning or putting your own flavor to it. The trick is, how do we get to that part of our soul? Mm, conventionally, the only time we get access to that part of our soul is under extreme emergencies. I don't know if the example is a perfect one, but a man sees a child caught stuck under a truck and he lifts the truck up to save the child. Where is that coming from? His mind says, you can't do this. You can't lift trucks. What's wrong with you? What are you thinking? You're not going to lift a truck. But he ignores it. The emergency, the urgency of what needs to get done cancels all the subjective experiences that the person has. I can't, I want to, I won't. I'll, it's, it's gone. Those things are gone. The, the urgency of what needs to happen is so intense that the, all the objective, subjective experiences, in other words, me, gets canceled. And here's the amazing thing. When I get canceled, I am stronger. I'm capable of things that I would ordinarily be incapable of. Because the subjective part of me has been canceled and the objective part of me can do whatever it takes. It. One of the ways of understanding our faith in God is simply to say, there is the subjective me. My experience, my perception, my pleasure emotional, mental, whatever, but it's me. That is my daily routine. That's how I function day by day. I got to be me, as the song goes. So I am me. But then there's a reality much bigger than me. It's out there. I don't usually have access to the world out there. I live in my skin, I live in my abilities, and in my subjective, personal, selfish motivations. But I know there's a big world out there. I can be intimidated by it. I can ignore it, make believe it doesn't exist. But it's out there. <clears throat> Every now and then, 
we have an experience that puts us right in the path of objective reality and we can't ignore it and you can't be overwhelmed by it you need to do something and your inner workings meaning your subjective self is incapable you've got to reach beyond yourself and that is possible truly possible because there is a part of our soul that is purely objective it has no color it has no agenda it will not impose itself on the experience it will allow the reality out there in other words the objective truth to motivate my behavior when we say faith in god we don't mean i think there's a god i i want to please him faith in god means my ability to step into the objective truth that is much greater, much stronger, and much higher than my subjective experiences. What does that do? Makes me indestructible. You can't intimidate a person who is objective. Intimidation affects only your subjective experience. I don't want to die. Okay, then I got you over a barrel. I'm using your subjective feelings and experiences against you. Knowing how much you don't want to die, knowing how afraid you are of pain, I, I can manipulate you and get you to do things you don't want to do. I can scare you. But the reason I can scare you is because there are functions within your personality that thrive on experiencing, feeling, tasting. And if you die, you're not going to have any of that. So the subjective you is vulnerable. People who really know how to take advantage of others is because they read people very well. As I get the clearer, the clearer my picture of you is, your subjective needs or pleasures, the more I can manipulate you. So those master brainwashers or manipulators, and they read people so well, they know exactly what to do to get to your weak spot. But when they run up against a person who is objective, they're, they're lost. They can't do anything. For example, if you don't cooperate, we're going to hurt you. And the person says, I know that, but what you're asking me to do is wrong. It's wrong. Well, if you don't cooperate, we'll have to kill you. I hear that, but wrong is wrong. When a person is focused on an objective truth, you can't scare him. But let's not talk about scare tactics. Let's talk about the nobler, higher, more, more godly aspect of life. The ability to be objective is almost divine and superhuman. Almost. Because there is a part of me, in my soul, natural, that is capable of absolute objective perception. And when I see the objective perception, nothing will stop me. Because it is what it is. You can't destroy it, so you can't threaten me. How do we get to that? Little steps. 
How do we train a child? We train a child to move gradually, slowly, painlessly from the subjective experience to the objective experience. Those who master this art can get past all subjective experience in favor of the objective. There was a chosid of the uh, first Chabad Rebbe in uh, 1812, back in Russia. He was spying for the Tsar against France, against Napoleon. He worked his way up to um, a translator of the most delicate and the most uh, important, vital conversations and decisions made in the uh, military headquarters. And Napoleon walked in one day and sensed, he was a little psychic, he sensed that there was a spy in the room. And of course, the odd fellow out was the chassid, the translator. So Napoleon said to him, I think you're a spy. And I'm going to find out because I'm going to put my hand on your heart. And if it's beating wildly out of fear, then I know you're a spy. And he went and he put his hand on the man's heart and the heart beat calmly. He says, oh, I guess you're not. Afterwards, the chassid attributed his calm heartbeat to what he studied in Hasidus. The Hasidic concept of the mind governs the heart. You see, you would think his life was just threatened. If he's a spy, he's dead. So he desperately has to keep his heart from beating fast. Will that help calm the heart? <laughs> or is that like a catch-22? The more desperately you need your heart to beat calmly, the more wildly it's going to beat. So how did he get his heart to be calm? Out of self-preservation? No, that would make him hysterical. He was able to tune into an objective place in his soul. And in that objective place, dying is not a threat. You can't scare me because I, I'm focused on the objective reality, not the subjective. As soon as I'm out of the subjective realm, there's no fear. The fear comes from self-awareness, from the subjective. That is an amazing thing. And not everybody is going to achieve that level of uh, objectivity. But we must have some. So what do you tell a child? I know you want that toy, but it's not yours. What are you saying? What are you, what are you seeing there? Here's a showdown between the subjective and the objective. Subjectively, the child wants the toy. Objectively, it doesn't belong to him. That's just a simple objective fact. So sometimes we ruin it. And you say to a four-year-old, you can't take that toy. It's Tommy's toy. And if you take it, Tommy is going to be very sad. <laughs> so you're just replacing one subjective experience with another. And to the child, that means, oh, so you like Tommy better than me? <laughs> if I don't take the toy, I'll be upset. If I do take the toy, Tommy will be upset. And you're telling me not to take the toy? So that's not necessarily a good message. 
Seems like you like Tommy better than me. The better message is, it's not right. Not Tommy is going to be upset. Even if Tommy is not upset, it's not right to take somebody else's toy. Objective. So when you say that, what you're telling the child, what you're saying to the child is, you have your subjective feelings. I understand that. I, I hear that. Uh, I've, I've experienced that too. Things I wanted very badly, but they weren't mine. So what do you do? You go by the objective truth, not the subjective. This generation, by the way, is desperate for this message. Completely lost it. The subjective is everything. Not only because I want it. I am told to want it. And I am told that what I want is the top of the totem pole. You must get what you want. What you want is absolutely essential. Nothing should stand in your way of getting what you want. Bad message. And, and look, at, look at the damage. Look at what's going on with people today who cannot seem to get past themselves even in an emergency. So, we train ourselves, we train our children in little steps, in little ways. Choose the objective over the subjective. Exercise that muscle until the objective becomes as real, as available, as immediate, as clear as your subjective experiences. <clears throat> that is a very healthy human being. Probably also a very moral human being. It can be evil. The Nazis at the, at the war trials all used the same excuse. Following orders. I was just following orders. I'm not a murderer. I don't enjoy killing people. I was just following orders. I was being objective, not subjective. So I'm a nice guy. Killed a lot of people, but I was just following orders. That's the abuse of the ability to be objective. And that's if you believe them. If you believe that it was purely following orders. But let, let's assume it was. That is the extreme opposite. <clears throat> the abuse of the ability to be objective. Which is a divine gift. And to abuse that is the ultimate crime. So let's call that vulnerability. Vulnerability doesn't mean be weak. Vulnerability means get past your subjective experiences and look at the world through an objective lens. Then you are being vulnerable, but you are being strong. Stronger than your subjective impulses. Try this. It's good to be vulnerable. Only strong people are vulnerable. And to be vulnerable means don't make it about yourself. Don't be subjective about everything. Give yourself a little, a little holiness, a little sanctity. And that means focus on the objective 
objective. Focus on what is really real. Get yourself out of the way for a moment. Again, in little things, not, not heroics. But if you do this day by day, you get closer to that part of your soul that can truly be objective. That's how you become a mensch. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us. Take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best, and join us for some enjoyable conversation.